So I think you can imagine that if you're writing a series for upwards of 30 years, you're gonna run into a few inconsistencies and some things that really don't make all too much sense. Maybe you didn't explain enough here and there or you left things just too vague. I mean, it's to be expected. A perfect example of this is in JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Oraki, as much as the community wants to believe, isn't some kind of omnipotent god. He's not gonna be able to plan out a story stretching decades right from the start. This guy comes up with ideas on the spot and writes them down. He doesn't plan these things through all of the way. So of course there's gonna be some errors or some loose ends that aren't gonna be tied up. But actually, Araki thought about this recently and he decided to green light a spin-off based on Josuke and Whole Horse? Yeah, that's right. Crazy Diamond's Demonic Heartbreak, a 16 part miniseries that takes place between parts three and four. And I gotta tell you, it's actually a pretty good read. Hi y'all, I'm Bayfun and resident Jojo aficionado. So of course I had to take a look at this manga. This series was being published in Ultra Jump and just ended this May, which was a bit of a shock to me because I thought that this series could go on quite a bit further. But I guess better to end a series before you start milking it. And the story is pretty much as I said, it takes place in Moria around 1999 with Josuke and a whole horse as the main protagonists. And as you know, chaos and bizarre stuff starts happening. And now you might be thinking, is this story even canon? I know that there's some people out there that like to use that big scary word and only are interested in things that are officially canon. But I can clearly say with full confidence that this is unofficial. Even though it was greenlit by Iraqi himself on the last chapter, Chapter, you can clearly see that this was an unofficial record of things that happened in this period of time. That doesn't mean you can't take it in as headcanon, because this is kind of like in the same vein as something like Purple Haze Feedback, another wonderful spinoff that's just meant to fill in the blanks. Whether or not you consider it canon, it doesn't harm the source material. If anything, it actually makes it better. It enriches all of the characters and their individual story arcs. And this is helped greatly by the author himself, Kohei Kodono, who, if you don't know, is an industry legend. He's the guy that wrote Boogie Pop, which was a series that was evidently inspired by JoJo's Bizarre Adventures. And he also wrote that before mentioned Purple Haze Feedback. He loves this franchise and knows exactly what makes it work. And that's something that you can clearly, clearly see here with the characters. I wanna start by talking about not just the half horse, but the whole horse. That fan favorite cowboy that fans absolutely adore because this is a bigger deep dive than he has ever had as a character. It's been 10 years since Dio and he has severe PTSD. I think that his inclusion in the story is phenomenal because I don't think that there's any other character other than our original Crusaders that has a bigger connection with Dio than Whole Horse. He had the most character, the most development, and the most open-ended ending. So they took that and ran with it. His possibilities were endless and of course that would lead him to go into more. Because with Boingo and Toph in his hand, they were looking for a specific bird. Which again leads me to one of the things that I think is very neat to see. And that is seeing all of the remaining villains of part three just live their lives. See where they ended up. Because not all of them were just completely crippled or dead. But none of them is really in a place where they can feel that they can forget about Dio. And this fear and connection to him is something that occurs throughout the entirety of the story. And when Whole Horse gets to Morio and encounters the phenomenon of Stan users attracting stand users and he meets Josuke, the Josuke that we encounter isn't the one from part four. This whole story takes place legitimately like maybe a week or two before the main story. So he still hasn't met Koichi or Jotaro yet, but he still somehow acts exactly the same. When I first started reading this, I was a little bit confused about the entire timeline and how everything worked because it still wasn't announced that it was like a prequel. So I just assumed that it took place after part four until Josuke just plainly flat out says that he's just become a freshman. And I think this works because we also see a bit of a different side with Josuke, maybe someone that's a little bit more cheekier, especially towards the end, and I thought that that was something nice to see. But I would say that probably one of the best characters is a new one with Ryoko Kakyoin. Yes, Kakyoin, like that exact same Kakyoin. Because as you see, this mystery doesn't just involve a bird, it also goes into the backstories of quite a few other characters, thus leading to some pretty big reveals like how Kakyoin actually comes from Moria, kind of making that connection a little bit more obvious on why Koichi's outfit looks exactly like Kakyoin. Now, of course it makes fucking sense because they went to the same school and a lot more connections and references and explanations are brought up throughout. Ryoko is someone that carries a lot of trauma with her as she's the person that blames herself for Kakyoin going missing. Because when she was little, she kind of led Kakyoin into encountering Dio. This trauma makes her want to uncover the truth as much as she can. And I think that pretty much everything about her is fantastic. Her backstory, the big reveal, and her character design are something that is very, very in tone with Jojo as a whole. I I mean, she keeps that little swirl there to remind her of her hero. 
Remind you of someone? Yeah, it definitely does not feel like it was crammed in for the hell of it. It feels like it was planned and careful. And I think this spinoff does the best thing that any spinoff can do, and that's treat its characters right, as accurate as possible, and just giving them amazing stories. And from right here on, I think I wanna talk a little bit more about spoilers, because I wanna talk about what makes this series so much more in my eyes than just a regular spinoff. And this is when it comes to the big reveals, flashbacks, and just overall the explanation of things that we all had questions about. I already touched on the first one, which really isn't a spoiler at all because that's something that was mentioned in like the first chapter, and that's that Kakyoan is from Moria. That's something that fans had been theorizing for many, many years. I mean, there's a reason that people think Jotaro likes Koichi because he reminds him of Kakyoan. So this just adds a ton more fuel to the fire. But there's so many other scenes that are just like this littered throughout the entire manga. We get to see the perspective of Whole Horse and Boingo running away as Dio and Kakyoin are in their big fight. We experience the moments of where Dio recruits the stand users like with Darby. And we also get potential closure on some questions that we had that weren't even revolving parts three and four. Because we also catch a glimpse of when Whole Horse was in Dio's mansion, he grabs and saves some women and takes them away from, you know, Dio's lair so that they don't die. I don't know what y'all might have interpreted that moment as, but I saw this as Whole Horse saving the moms of the sons of Dio. And if you want to go even deeper and put on a tinfoil hat and look at the implications of the story, even though they didn't show it directly, one of the women that Whole Horse saved could have been Giorno's mom, thus wrapping up the entire question of how did she make it out of Dio's mansion. All really resolved right here. I don't care if you just say that this is just plain fan service, it's done in such a smart way that it just kind of makes sense. When Whole Horse saved those women, it wasn't shown in the next text box or the next exposition dump that they grew up to be so-and-so. It's implied, and you connect the dots on your own. Though the most in-your-face one that I think I can really think of is probably one of my favorite ones, and that was on the last chapter, because that's when we see that Josuke's grandfather actually saw Toph's vision of him dying, which prompted him to call up Joseph Joestar, leading us exactly into part four. I just thought that that was, that was the the chef's fucking kiss. That was absolutely beautiful to see. In order to plot these things like beat for beat, you need someone that's going to be a big super fan of the series. And Kadano Sensei does fantastic work. There were also quite a lot of other things that I think a lot of other people might be interested in, such as the stand battles. Really creative stands here that work off the characters rather well. Because just think about it as an example, when you've got a stand that can just make you relive past events and you've got PTSD, you're in for quite a shitty ride. I would say the fights in this are pretty good. They're up to the standard of what Jojo is known for. But for me, the themes in the story were the main things that just kept me in the entire time. Watching these characters grow and evolve is fantastic. As we see them let go of that guilt, hate, and resentment all naturally. It all flows really well, and the resolution doesn't feel forced at all, even though this is just 16 chapters. The biggest surprise character-wise for me was when Josuke asked that Ryoko at the very end. I knew that guy was bold and kind of crazy, but I didn't know he had that much risen up. God damn. But the story led him into a great conclusion where it just segues perfectly into part four. I recommend this story to all JoJo fans, regardless of if your favorite parts are three, four, or whatever they could be. I like it because it just adds so much more context and world building. You're not gonna feel that your experience with this story is gonna degrade or be hindered by reading this. If anything, it's gonna feel so much more enriched. And it's also not too long of a read. I'd be surprised if it took you over an hour to get through it all. But I swear, you're not going to be disappointed. And with this, I think that wraps up the majority of my thoughts on Crazy Diamond's Demonic Heartbreak. What did you think about it? Did you like it? Did you hate it? Is there something that I missed? Please let me know down in the comments below. I'd be interested to see because this is like the first JoJo spinoff manga to come out. As always, I was Bayfomed and I'll see you guys next time. Peace. <laughs>